Well, I'm um, delighted to uh, introduce our next speaker, Henning Stevens. Um, Henning is a wildlife biologist with Warehouser, which uh, I'm sure you all know is a timber company that has lands uh, in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. And this is a great perspective because so far we've really been thinking about forest conservation and forest bird conservation in the context of small, non-industrial woodlot owners. And it's important to remember the eastern half of the FEMC region has enormous commercial forest lands that are really important in supporting biodiversity, including uh, several bird species of high conservation concern. So the perspective that Henning can give us on, on those lands is, is unique today and really important. So welcome, Henning. Thank you, John, and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about commercial forests, and uh, I'm going to uh, start off with the landscape, of course, the big picture, and then I'll filter down to uh, the stand level. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we, as commercial forest owners, uh, acquire data and use data. And then I'll uh, touch on a little bit about uh, business conservation drivers, so that'll uh, uh, we just talked about business plans there, uh, and then I'll finish up with some exciting opportunities from my perspective. Uh, and uh, one caveat before I begin is I'm one uh, biologist for one company, uh, so this talk is about commercial forests. Um, but I did reach out uh, to some of my colleagues in the industry uh, with my talk outline, so in some sense this is a broader, uh, a broader talk about commercial of forestry. So in the landscape, uh, big picture, obviously keeping forest forests very important uh, for bird conservation. And as uh, commercial landowners, uh, we're typically a large ownership. We can be blocked up, or we can be a little bit dispersed, uh, oftentimes a uh, combination. Um, lots of influencers on that uh, commercial land. Uh, we heard uh, this morning someone talk about uh, Vermont's UVA program, but a lot of states have some type of uh, taxation program uh, where the land is taxed at the current use, and that's a big incentive for, um, for uh, commercial landowners. Uh, and obviously, healthy wood products markets are important in keeping those forest forests in this uh, global dynamic world we live in today. But in New England and in other places, uh, the forest products industri industry has been here for a long, long time, so I'm encouraged. Uh, that, uh, that this industry is resilient and will be here for a long time as well uh, going into the future. Uh, on the landscape, think, think of multiple landowners. Uh, we've heard a lot of talks about non-industrial uh, uh, private landowners this morning. Uh, you have your federal and state lands out there. And all of those together uh, provide uh, different goals, uh, uh, different management strategies, different mandates. They all provide a lot of habitat diversity out there at the landscape, uh, often complementing each other. Uh, other landscape tools out there include conservation easements and uh, fee sales, conservation sales. Uh, perhaps they are targeting a rich uh, biodiversity hotspots in the landscape or high value recreation areas on the landscape. Again, all uh, together working uh, from what I, what I call the shifting habitat mosaic. And uh, Scott, uh, talked a little bit about that here earlier, other folks as well, and uh, just think about all the different uh, complexities of stand structure moving across the landscape uh, on individual owners, on one commercial uh, ownership in a landscape, or among all those different landowners. And a little bit more on that, um, we also heard uh, this talk is, um, a lot of folks uh, uh, intersected my talk so far, so good session, John, putting <laughs> these uh, folks together. Um, we've heard a lot about the landscape needs of early successional habitat this morning and, the, and this afternoon. Um, you know, not just early succession, but the forest thinnings uh, that go on, obviously bringing that light to the ground, getting some herbaceous and shrub growth going uh, for those mid-story uh, nesters. Uh, some folks touched on the emerging science. I think Scott mentioned, uh, you know, the wood thrush uh, moving their young from one stage to the other. and. Golden Wings doing the reverse. Uh, that's really neat information. Migration refueling, birds using early successional habitats and other types. Uh, so that's again uh, related to that shifting habitat mosaic. Um, and then this is a bird session, uh, but as a forest landowner, 
uh, we're managing and addressing all sorts of biodiversity. So uh, not only species of concern, we want to keep uh, you know common species common, whether they're birds or or herps, and uh, that's where this coarse and fine scale filter approach works well together, in my opinion. The coarse scale is that shifting habitat mosaic, the different land ownerships, and then the fine scale I'll talk a little bit about next. Uh, but a commercial uh, forest landscape uh, is made up of lots of different patch sizes. Uh, and those patch sizes are resulting, obviously, from, from harvest units or harvest blocks. And uh, lots of influencers on those patch sizes and shapes. Uh, and one obvious is the previous management of that patch. And that might have happened you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago when that original uh, area was harvested. And you sort of, uh, today, you're sort of dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hand of cards that you've been dealt. Obviously, there's physical features that influence that patch. You have streams, you have wetlands, you have topography, soil types, you have your harvest and re regeneration goals, st state regulations in, in some places affecting that patch size. Uh, the forester, uh, when he's designing that patch, uh, that next harvest unit, taking into account all sorts of special sites. I've listed some here. You've got streams and their buffers and wetlands and other water features. You've got rare plants and, and uh, natural communities to address. Uh, deer wintering areas is probably 20 or 30 other special sites. Again, at the stand scale, adding diversity uh, to the landscape, adding to, to bird conservation. And then uh, those foresters are also designing, uh, you know, and addressing specific habitat feature elements out there. Things like snags and large diameter green uh, live trees, uh, down wood, uh, patch retention, unique little habitat patches are addressed as well, um, added to that diversity and uh, bird habitat. And then how does this all happen? How does it all get done on the ground? Uh, typically a commercial a forest landowner, they are using professional foresters, either on staff or consulting foresters. Uh, they set up and design the harvest unit, and then they are <coughs> contracting with uh, loggers uh, to implement that, execute that on the ground. And both sets of those folks are trained, and that training is uh, including wildlife practices. So states have training programs. My company, we will only hire trained loggers and we have foresters on staff, and we have wildlife biologists on staff. Not every commercial company has that set up. Uh, but then there's special training. We heard a little bit uh, in the session around Audubon's uh, Forestry for the Birds here in Vermont. Uh, Maine has a program. I just learned that Massachusetts has a program as well. I know that some of our foresters and our company has, have undertaken that training. Uh, then all that uh, is baked into the company's operating procedures. Uh, for consistency, for accountability, etc. And so that is how that all happens, gets translated to on the ground. Uh, and then we incorporate new information uh, through cooperative research, which I'll also touch on here shortly. Um, and then species specific management. Uh, what I've talked about is sort of habitat based management, uh, but for some site dependent species, obviously the ones here. Uh, that return to a nest site every year. They're very easy to address in, in commercial forest management. Uh, you know, we can input that um, uh, information into our GIS, and then the first thing the, the forester will do when they're designing that harvest unit is consult the GIS and start planning, and all that information uh, uh, comes into play. And uh, uh, a great thing about this conference today is for 10 years I've been acquiring information from the state of Vermont uh, through Everett Marshall, and I met Everett Marshall today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's kind of neat. Um, and then some species have uh, special habitat needs, and so uh, we try to fit that into our management scheme as well. And I've given you two examples. Uh, Bicknell's thrush uh, is a nice example, right? Um, so uh, that's a species we're doing some work on with a local group here, uh, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and the University of Maine and the State of Maine. Uh, doing a couple projects uh, where we're thinking about uh, can we or should we um, retain some dense patches of young conifers uh, in the early stages of our management uh, to help their kind of breeding suitability across the landscape. Uh, so we're, we'll be monitoring that. 
And then the other example, you don't have to uh, read the details there, but that's the, for the Kirtland's <coughs> warbler, not a local species, but uh, my point on that slide is uh, very detailed experimentation and design going on to try to see if we can create some suitable habitat for the Kirtland's warbler. Another early successional species, but uh, we're trying to mix up red pine and jack pine, and they require some openings, and uh, we're trying to make that economical as well. So for, to really make that work in the commercial uh, forestry realm, uh, it's best if there can be a sort of an economic uh, factor uh, brought into that um, ecological design. Uh, so again, there can be some simple solutions, retaining some patches for Bicknell's, can be some complica complicated or more complex uh, solutions like the Kirtlands. Um, fortunately, uh, for many species, uh, there's a lot of positive intersections uh, with birds uh, in forest management. Uh, some examples we've heard about today, like the woodcock. Uh, I was wondering if the golden wing warbler was the most frequent picture. So maybe a test for you, John, <laughs> on all the slides. Has anybody else noticed that? Woodcock and golden wing. Um, so, uh, but some recent work out, out of the University of uh, Maine, uh, Steve Dunham, uh, and others uh, found uh, that our very intensively managed spruce fir uh, forest types uh, or stands, uh, after we've thinned them and they've grown up in sort of a mid-age uh, structure, uh, uh, spruce grouse are doing very well uh, in that type of situation. And then New Hampshire Audubon uh, doing some work with rusty blackbirds, another great intersection between uh, management of that spruce fir type and that species. And uh, you know, lots of other work going on and uh, uh, helping to kind of verify that. Um, uh, point of this slide, I'm not gonna go through it all, but this is one way of, of how forced landowners acquire information for a continual improvement <coughs> of our practices. A lot of it is uh, university-based. Uh, University of Maine, for example, uh, they have a cooperative monitoring and, and research group, the Cooperative Forestry Research Unit. Uh, industry puts in about $600,000 a year into that uh, co-op. And they do a lot of silviculture or tree work, but there's a big wildlife component. And, and uh, that spruce grouse work, uh, Brian Rolex work on, on um, uh, spruce fir uh, species uh, uh, is part of that co-op as well. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, uh, NACASI, that's a national group, so we work, uh, get information are integrated with local folks like BCE, uh, regional groups like the universities, and then national groups like NACASI. They leverage money from industry and, and federal partners and, and university partners to get a lot of wildlife work done. Uh, partners in Flight has sort of an industry working group that's um, supposed to be all industries, but it's largely the commercial forest uh, uh, industry. Uh, and then the bottom one, uh, I'll just uh, point out uh, under state and federal agencies, NAFO is a, um, stands for the National Alliance of Forest Owners, and that's a large landowner group, and they have recently uh, started a initiative with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for at-risk species, and that's where the Kirtland's work is to, sort of stemming out from and uh, you know that we're working in all the different regions, all different taxa, and that's an exciting uh, kind of recent development. Uh, any other points on that slide? Uh, trying to race through here. Um, uh, conservation drivers, business conservation drivers. Uh, why why are commercial landowners interested? Why are we doing this? Um, there's some fairly, in my mind, some simple reasons and. That top bullet is uh, trying to um, stay current with changing societal expectations around environmental stewardship. And that's been going on for decades. And if you think about it, uh, forestry is a long-term mm -hmm. business. If you are planting uh, your investment today you're up here in the northern forest, it could be 40 years for spruce fir. It could be 60, 80 years for, for maples and oak. And so during that whole uh, multiple decade time, you want to make sure that you have a healthy environment that you can realize that investment at that point. Um, and then we've heard a lot about uh, the recognition uh, and, and the benefits of active forest management today and how important that is as a tool. 
And uh, it's nice to be part of solutions uh, for bird conservation, for, for landscape uh, solutions. So um, those are some thoughts around uh, conservation drivers. And, and then um, another driver is sustainable forestry certification. So I'm assuming that uh, many of you are familiar with certified products, uh, whether it be paper. I was wondering if the um, coffee today uh, at the conference was bird-friendly coffee. Does anybody know? Hmm. Looks like that's a no. I guess that's a no. Oh, I'm sure it's a no. Sorry. Yes. Okay. But I didn't. That, we'll have to take that up with Jim Duncan. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's three major certification systems for wood products or for, for forests in the U.S. All of them have biodiversity guidelines. Uh, and the majority of commercial forests are certified. Uh, and I think uh, globally only about 10% of forests are certified. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do in the, in the world, but the U.S., uh, there is, you know, uh, I'm not sure of the factor, but there could be over 100 million acres of certified wood uh, here in the country. And uh, third-party audits are part of that certification, so we have independent folks come in and check us, do an audit of our operations. They go out in the field, they look through paperwork, we provide all sorts of evidence. Uh, so it's a great mechanism for engagement and action. And just to um, quickly touch base, give you some examples of sustainable forestry standards, there's about 100 or more, 120 uh, standards that we have to follow with our certification program. Uh, but there's requirements for uh, stand and landscape level uh, measures. Um, there's requirements for some of the habitat features that I talked about earlier. There's requirements for regional conservation planning. So that's a, a way that we can align with state wildlife action plans and the species of greatest conservation need. There's requirements not only for addressing threatened an endangered species, but also species of concern. So that's an intersection into those species like the Bicknell's thrush, rusty blackbirds. And there's um, uh, requirements around invasive species to make sure that these habitats stay and function like they should. Uh, anybody know the invasive species in the photo? That's been, yeah, someone I heard frag, got Phragmites out there. So um, we're out there treating Phragmites to keep those wetlands. Uh, pure. Uh, and then just to finish up my last slide, and this is, I think, uh, looks like a great segue to the next uh, talk, um, is from my perspective, some of the exciting uh, opportunities out there is with our remote sensing uh, uh, technology. Um, you know, LIDAR is an example, and there's probably things that I don't even know about, uh, but, you know, we're able to uh, measure every tree out there remotely, you know, using LIDAR. I mean, that's the, the top two pictures is, are the same. And not only the trees, but reach down and look at the understory. So I think the opportunities to measure habitat out there uh, is amazing. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm, I'm not a very knowledgeable about the acoustic uh, monitoring devices, but the idea of, of being able to stick these recording devices out there in the forest, record birdsong, run that through a computer, um, and lots of data analyzed, but it's, uh, it's more accurate, it's uh, uh, safer, uh, so lots of uh, neat things coming that way. Um, and then from my perspective, we need to continue uh, the, the uh, individual species level work. We need to understand how all those pieces fit together. But what's really exciting, and uh, Scott touched on this, is the landscape modeling and uh, how uh, to kind of verify that shifting habitat mosaic out there, understand how we need to tweak that uh, into the future. And with that, we're done. Well, thanks, Henning. And I think we're, uh, looks like we're right up on two. So, but Henning will be here. So I know I have some things I wanted to ask him. If you have questions, I hope you'll uh, grab Henning after the session.